Okay, here we go. This will be our very first support video for the semester, and it's a quick review. So I'm going to go through this, uh, try to get it done in a rapid fashion, and just take some notes in your notebook as you go along. You'll be expected to know what the different parts of speech of the English language are. Okay, so let's get right into it here. There are core, there are eight core categories uh, that are part of the parts of speech organization of words in English. Uh, I've used the abbreviation of uh, POS to indicate parts of speech. So let's see what those are. So this should be familiar. Number one, we have verbs. Number two, nouns. And I, I put pronouns as part of the nouns category because they're performing exactly the same function or job in, in sentences. Some people put them as different categories, but I think that if they do the same job, they should be uh, located in the same place. Number three is adjectives. Number four, adverbs. Five, conjunctions. Conjunctions are, uh, so if, if you look, there's two categories here, the category on the left or the, or the column on the left, and then you'll see that we'll go down to eight on the right-hand side. And what you'll notice is the words on the left-hand side, they're what I call content words. They carry kind of value or meaning. And the words on the right, the other uh, words are what we call grammatical words. So they help us to organize um, and to set up sentences and to uh, link things together. So conjunctions are the linking words in sentences. So they can also link nouns together. Um, and we'll get into that as the presentation con continues here. Number six, interjections. These are very seldomly used, but we'll cover them anyways, just to be complete in our description of everything. Number seven, articles. Now, articles are short grammatical words that are connected to nouns, as you'll see when we move into the examples. And finally, number eight, prepositions. So you're expected to understand these words. Uh, we'll give you definitions in a second. Verbs. Verbs are words of action, thoughts, and feelings. So these are, these are the active words within the sentence, um, and they're one of the two most important categories of words that we find in English sentences. So for example, Milo climbed Mount Everest. Which word there conveys action? If you said climbed, you're correct. Now, one of the other interesting things about verbs is that they describe action to us, but they also tell us about time, when something happens in, in terms of a frame of time. So you can have present tense, you can have past tense, you can have future tense. And in fact, in English, there's a very wide uh, array of different uh, verb tenses. Second example here, and this is another example that'll show us different tense, a different, a different time frame. He had desired that triumph for years. So if you're to look at this sentence, which word or words would you say make up the verb? If you said had desired, you'd be correct. And this is one of the interesting things to note about verbs. Often what I call the verb complex or the, the verb structure will include more than one word, and especially when we get into the more complicated verb tenses. You might need two or even three words uh, as part of that verb complex. Final example, he was exhausted at the top. What is the verb here? So if you said was exhausted, again, you would be correct. And obviously all three of these examples are kind of building on the same idea, but it shows you another thing that you can note is usually the verbs come near the beginning of the sentence. And in fact, uh, we'll see that verbs and nouns are the two most important categories of words in English, and the two of them together can create a sentence on their own. Um, so we also can talk about this in another way. We talk about nouns and verbs. We can also talk about what we call the subject and the predicate. The subject is the person, place, or thing that is doing the action. And the predicate is the action that is happening in the sentence. So subject and predicate can make up a complete sentence. Noun and verb can make up a complete sentence. Okay, let's carry on. Nouns, and I include pronouns here as I stated uh, earlier. So nouns are words that explain people, places, things, or concepts. And pronouns are a shorter version of a noun, and we use them when we're restating, like if you're describing something in a paragraph or describing a person in a paragraph, 
it would be really repetitive to use their name over and over again. So when you go into your secondary or tertiary description of that person, you can switch into the pronoun um, for variety. Okay, so here are some examples of nouns. We have bicycle, boat, woman, Kathmandu, Nepal, so that's obviously a location in a country. Biology, that's a subject in school. And poetry, that's a thing. Um, and now let's take a look at some pronouns. Now, you'll see this a little bit longer and more complex here. And this is because, as we mentioned before, uh, we w when we're talking about nouns, they can be the subject in a sentence. That's the person, place, or thing that is doing the action, that's kind of driving the bus, if you would. Um, or they can be the object. They can also be in a possessive form. So when we look at nouns or pronouns, we have to think about what job they're doing. And this is a good time for me to mention something that I often mention or, or bring up in one of my first classes every semester. It's the idea of form and function. Form and function. So when we're looking at words in English, we can always investigate it through both of those windows or both of those lenses or perspectives. Form or function. What's the form of the word? Is it a noun? Okay. What's its function? What's it doing? Is it a subject? Is it an object? Is it a possessive? Um, is it reflexive? So there's, there's lots of different forms that words can take. So we'll, we'll learn more about that as we go along. And you can see here I've given a pretty complete list of pronouns. He, she, it, that's the subjective form of pronouns. Him, her, it, that's the objective form of pronouns. His, her, its, that's the possessive form. And we'll learn more about this as we practice identifying these parts of speech. Okay, adjectives, this is our third category. Adjectives are words that provide more description, and they're usually um, used to describe nouns. So thus, because they're used to describe nouns, they come before nouns. So here is a list of examples. We've got red, tall, beautiful, horrible, clever, gritty, flighty, or hardworking. And the last one, hardworking, is uh, actually a um, hyphenated word. And you'll notice that we'll, we'll talk more about these, these types of adjectives. Um, and we'll actually have a big list of them to help us with our descriptive writing. Adjectives, descriptive words, they modify nouns. Okay, perfect, so let's move on. Adverbs, so as we can guess, adjectives modify nouns, so we can guess adverbs are gonna modify what? If you said verbs, you're bang on. So adverbs are words that provide more description for verbs. Sometimes they can also describe an adjective in a sentence or other adverbs, we kind of can stack them together. Um, and let's take a look at this. Most commonly, they're used to modify verbs. And one more piece of advice when looking for them, they usually end with ly. And quite often, you can change an adjective into an adverb by adding ly to the end of the adjective. So just a little bit more information. Um, and they, they're a little bit more flexible in terms of their placement. They can come before or after verbs. So example here, they talked quickly and quietly. Which word or words are adjectives here? If you said quickly and quietly, you're on point. Second example here, she was very smart and completed the work rapidly. Okay, there are actually two um, different adverbs here. What are they? If you said very and rapidly, you would be correct. Let's move on. Okay, so now we've moved out of our content words and we're moving into our grammatical words. First, we're looking at conjunctions. Um, so we've got a fair bit of information here and you can see I've done a bit of color coding to help um, organize things. And that's a nice segue because conjunctions are actually organizational words. They help us to set up different types of sentences and to explain relationships between uh, clauses within sentences or words uh, within phrases. So there are two important types or subcategories of conjunctions. We've got coordinating conjunctions and subordinating conjunctions, and we'll learn about both different types. So I use the abbreviation coconj in my classes to describe coordinating conjunctions. Um, and they're used to form what we call compound sentences. We'll be learning about sentences as we move forward. And there's a little um, device, a memory device that we can use to help us remember the coordinating conjunctions, and that's fanboys, for and nor, but, or, yet, so. Just that small grouping. And I, I call that the fanboys family. And 
we can also call them coordinating conjunctions. Okay, second grouping is called subordinating conjunctions, and I use the abbreviation uh, subconj. Uh, and they're used to form what we call complex sentences. And those are just different names. You might see the sentence types described in a wide variety of ways, but I'm going to use my own system, and hopefully we'll learn that system effectively together. Um, systems learning, by the way, is one of our other lectures in the first week, and, and the idea of systems learning is really important for students or anybody moving into a new job. Essentially, it's talking about the idea that every environment, many environments, many different types of things we need to learn have their own system. So if we can kind of make our minds malleable at being able to quickly absorb new systems, it'll give us an advantage in life. Okay, so here's a list of some of the subordinate conjunctions. It's actually a really long list will be provided very soon, probably in week one, of about 50 common ones. But here's a list of the most common ones. Although, because, even, even though, after, since, though, and whatever. And a lot of those other words like whenever, wherever, they can also be used as subordinating conjunctions. Okay, so let's take a look. So first we've got a sentence that's actually what we call a compound sentence. And you can see we've used a coordinating conjunction in combination with a comma. Commas go naturally together with our conjunctions. And we'll learn how to, to, to make them live together effectively. So he talked, comma, and she listened. That's a compound sentence. Next one is an example of a complex sentence. I actually call these complex A. There's two types of complex, complex A and complex B. And it depends on where the subordinate conjunction is placed within the sentence. Um, when you have this, the subordinate conjunction at the beginning of a sentence, you need the comma in the middle between the two ideas. Because it was review, comma, they already knew most of it. Excellent. So these are conjunctions. Okay, interjections. Uh, interjections are short words that are used to express greetings, emotions, surprise, exclamations, and also curses. Let's keep it clean here. Keep your minds uh, on the straight and narrow. So examples, hey, wow, ouch, darn, oh, these are all interjections. They're not the most commonly used words, but I like to go over uh, and clarify each of the eight categories, um, just so you know. Example one, drat, I cannot find my keys. Okay, good, so that's a simple example. You could use one of the other um, from the list here and make your own sentence if you want to practice. Next, we're talking about articles. Well, this category is sometimes not included in the traditional list of the parts of speech, but I think it's important because they are unique words. Now, I don't mean like articles from a magazine. This is the grammar word articles, um, and it's actually used to talk about specialized words that we place in front of either singular or plural nouns or specific nouns. Um, uh, they, are not, they, are, they are not needed with proper nouns, so that should actually be they. A little uh, editing error there, but you'll forgive me. You know life happens. Okay, so here are the list of articles. A, an, and the. Just three short little words that we put in front of nouns that are singular, plural, or specific. Okay, so let's take a look here at the sentence. How many articles do we find in this sentence? You can see them quite clearly. There's three of them. And you can see that when we want to talk about a specific noun, we use the. When we want to talk about what I'd call a singular noun or one of many possible examples of the same thing, we use a or an, and it depends on whether or not the word starts with a vowel. If it starts with a consonant, we use a. If it starts with a vowel, we use an. The tall girl reached up to grab a cherry blossom from the tree. So you can see each of the nouns in the sentence needs an article if it's going to be grammatically correct, especially with singular nouns, nouns of just one, it's really important to include articles, either the indirect article, that's a or an, or the direct article, which is the. Excellent. Okay, moving on. F final category here. Eight of eight prepositions. These are words used to describe location, time, and degree of use. Prepositions are phrases as phrases are often added to sentences at the beginning or at the end. They can be added in the middle too. Here's an example of some of the common ones, in, on, under, by, beside, or through. And there are many more. Again, a full list will be provided. In the beginning, comma, 
there was light. So this is talking about time. Alrighty, so that covers our eight categories. Study, take notes, you need to know this.